Hey everyone, welcome to oops. Hey everyone, welcome to the live stream there. My little counter wasn't working. Thank you for joining me today. And this is going to be a photography Q&A. But before we begin, I do want to send out a great big thank you to everybody who has shown up here, but also to everybody who has supported me as I've kind of struggled with COVID here. As many of you know, I was hospitalized with COVID. I was in the ICU. I was there for about two weeks and almost didn't survive the experience. And I just wanted to say thank you. The outpouring from the photography community was absolutely overwhelming. And I just wanted to pass along my heartfelt thanks to everybody. It really meant a lot. We probably had a thousand at least messages from people wishing me well and wishing, you know, you know, fast recovery and all that. And I really do appreciate that as well as uh, we had a ton of people make contributions at the website to help us out. And lots of people bought books and video workshops and stuff. All of that really meant a lot. So I do really, really appreciate it. And if I do look a little bit smaller, I lost about 20 pounds during the experience, but I am getting much better. When I first came home, I was barely able to walk to the bathroom when I had oxygen and everything else. And as you can see, doing much better. I actually went on a 1.3 mile hike yesterday. So coming along good. So that's about all I want to talk about with the COVID though. So let's focus on some photography stuff. So if you guys have some questions, I imagine you do, go ahead and start posting them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. So uh, one of the questions I saw earlier that I'm going to address now, I'm waiting for some other ones to come in, was someone was asking, is it time to go mirrorless yet? That was one of the comments I saw before we started. And honestly, it's a really good question. And I think it's something that a lot of people are struggling with right now. You have a DSLR outfit and you're like, should I, should I make that plunge or am I too early? And there's so many factors that go into that. It's very difficult to say when the right time for mirrorless is. And a lot of this is going to depend on the types of photography, the types of subjects that you shoot. So, and your you know um, financial status too, as far as that goes, because it's not a cheap thing to do, especially if you're jumping systems. So it's kind of something that is going to be up to an individual and you're going to have to really evaluate what you're doing. I think the best thing to do is look at what you're doing now and look at the advantages that mirrorless would give you, or if there are any advantages and ask yourself, you know, is mirrorless going to actually bring anything new or anything better? Is there going to be pictures I can get easier or that I couldn't get before with my DSLRs if I switch to mirrorless? If the answer is no, it might be a good time just to kind of wait and see, because right now I kind of feel like mirrorless is right on that cusp of just about there. It's just about to take overtake DSLRs. In some cases, like with the Sony A1 and maybe the Sony A92 and the Canon R5, it has in many ways overtaken DSLRs. And even in some cases, even the Nikon system, there's a few things you can do with the Z cameras that you just can't do with DSLRs. So, you know, if some of those advantages actually would impact your photography in a meaningful way, then yeah, maybe it's time to start considering them. But if not, I've been telling everybody, right now, everything's still sorting out. We don't know who's going to be the, the, the best for mirrorless as time goes on. We really don't. Everything's very new. And I think the people that can wait, if you're not in a hurry, I think that's probably the best advice, just to hold back and see what comes from Nikon, Sony, and Canon before you dive into mirrorless. So that's my advice right now. So hopefully that helps. So I'm looking through the comments here. Uh, I'm gonna try to backtrack a little bit. There's a lot of them came in there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Am I excited for the Nikon D9? I think you mean the Z9. Yeah, I am excited to see that camera. I'm hoping that Nikon can deliver on it. I don't know anything about it. I've had a lot of questions. I kind of want to address this real quick. I have a lot of emails that come in and say, Steve, what do you think about the Z9? What's going to happen? I have no inside information at all. None at all. Nikon does not share anything with me. So what you know from Nikon rumors is exactly what I know. Uh, let's see here. Just looking through it. Any chance of workshops in North America? Uh, that might happen. We are starting to think about doing workshops here in the States. It's getting tougher and tougher to do international stuff, especially with all the COVID stuff. And depending on how that 
pans out, we may do fewer overseas stuff and we might start doing some stuff in North America. The best way to get on our workshops is to make sure you're on my email newsletter at the site. If there's going to be something announced, it's going to be in there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Tom's asking, does the D4S have group focus on a single point and FN on a button like you do with the A50? Nope, that camera does not support it. Uh, the only cameras that actually allow you to do that are the D500, D5, D6, and uh, D850 at the moment. Uh, let's see here. So I'm just kind of skimming through these. I know you guys have a ton of questions. I apologize in advance. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. So I'm just kind of skimming through the ones that I see, not just here, but I also encounter my email box a lot. Uh, Let's see. Sorry about the pauses here. Let's see. That's a good one there. I think I lost it. Uh, someone's asking. Let's see. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, the 428 versus 600 F4. Which would you choose? That's a hard question, guys. I think every wildlife photographer, anytime you're trying to, you're going to make that step to big glass and you're like, okay, which way do I go here? Because there's three options every single time. You have the 400 to 8, 500 to 4, 600 to 4. Which way should you go? And that's a hard, hard question. My rule of thumb has always been that you should pick the lens that you can use without teleconverters most of the time. Teleconverters add a whole nother level of complexity. They add another layer of something that can go wrong, if that makes sense. So for the most part, I, I use the 600 F4. I've been very happy with that, doing general wildlife photography, not just in North America, but I also, as you know, I go to Costa Rica and Africa. That has been a really great lens. And I have the Sony 600 F4 as well. And they're, you know, the Nikon and Sony 600 F4s are just phenomenal. They're a little bit big. So, you know, that's something to consider too. If, you know, size, weight, and travel capacity is a, a problem. The 600 F4s can sometimes be troublesome. Uh, 500 F4 is a good compromise because it gives you a, a lot of focal length, but it's a lot lighter and it's a lot easier to travel with. And it takes teleconverters really well too. The 400 to 8, the tempting thing there is that you have a 400 to 8 and then you can put a teleconverter on it at 1.4 and you have like a 560. Then you put another teleconverter, at 2X on it and you have an 800 5.6. And it's like, wow, you have kind of three lenses in one. Now I have seen very mixed results with that. For some people that works great and they love it and they swear by it and that is the way they go and that's great. I have had more people though, in I, people in my own workshops and that I've seen this, they've tried that combination and they're constantly fighting with teleconverters and they're you know, like, it's sharper with this one than that one. And you know, I'm having a hard time or I'm back focusing with this one now. And it just seems like there's just, when you start adding teleconverters as part of the main menu there, it seems like it can be, you know, especially if you have a couple of them mixed in there. I've seen, again, I've just seen mixed results. For me, I think it makes more sense just to pick the lens that you think you're going to use, the focal length that you think you're going to use most of the time without a teleconverter. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, I got a holes in my mouth, guys, just to keep my coughing down. Sometimes my coughing starts up. I didn't want to be hacking all over you here. Uh, let's see. This is a good one here. Howard asks, thoughts about the D850 in crop mode versus the D500 for bird photography? Um, I think, uh, hopefully that's working. I had a little error message come up there. My connection was unstable. Hopefully this is still going. Uh, I'll tell you my experience with the D850 and D500. I've had both cameras. When I got the D850, I got the grip for it. So I was getting nine frames per second. I had my D5 battery in there and stuff. And I think that, and after that, I don't think I ever really used the D500 anymore. I just used the D850. D850, and then I crop down to DX size, like, um, you know, manually, most of the time just on the computer down to that size. And the reason I like the D850 over the D500 for that is autofocus is pretty close. The D500 might have a little edge, but it's close enough for most purposes. I, I say I didn't really use the D500 after getting the D850. But the reason I liked that particular setup with the D850 over the D500 is because if I'm out shooting and I can fill the frame, great, I get all those full frame advantages, right? So that's really cool. But if something's a little farther away and maybe I'd have to crop to DX, well, guess what? That was just like using a D500, which I also liked. So I had the best of both worlds kind of in one camera. So that's what I, uh, that's one of the reasons I kind of favor that one. So let's see here. Oh, that's a good one. Do I feel 
Do you feel using an app like Luminar to replace photos in Sky is ethical? Uh, for me, I, I think ethical is, is tricky. Everybody has their own line that they will or won't cross. For me, I think that's, go, that, that's a bridge too far. I don't like replacing skies. Uh, I know how to do it. I can do it without any of the assistance from you know the software. But the thing is, I like to represent what's there. And truthfully, it's just more work than I really want to do too. You know, most of the time, if I don't like the sky, I'll just pick another shot. I have literally on my hard drive, I have probably half a million shots sitting there. So I just, I'm to the point anymore. I shoot so much stuff that at least when I'm out, I haven't been shooting anything lately, obviously, but uh, at least when I'm out, I'm shooting so much stuff that there's no reason to to do it. But yeah, I'm not really a big fan of people replacing skies. I, I, I don't know that that's, you know, what's next, I guess, you know? So I'm, yeah, not, not a big fan. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's see here. Let's see. Sorry. My comments are kind of jumping around. Apologize for the delay here as I look. Uh, let's see here. Someone's asking about what's the uh, what's the problem for why Nikon is still struggling to get the Z system on par with Canon or Sony even after two years. Uh, it's better. I can tell you the Nikon system is better. I think Canon and Sony just have a little bit more money behind them. I really do. I think that's what it is. I think they're just a little bit ahead. But I also think that you're going to see Nikon have a, what I want to call a D3 moment. If you remember, Nikon was kind of struggling back with DSLRs. And then they said, hey, you know, we're going to, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to really, you know, knock everyone's socks off. And they did. They put out the D3. And from then on, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, there's no problem here anymore. They were, you know, class leading across the board for years. And I think we're going to see something similar with the Z9. Nikon tends to be a kind of a conservative company and they kind of just give you stuff that that, that works, you know what I mean? Uh, but they don't try to be bleeding edge. And I think that's what part of the difference is here. I think you're going to find though in the future, I wouldn't even be surprised if we see some firmware updates for the Z, uh, for the Z6 and 7 that improve that, that actual tracking mode, not just tracking in general, but the tracking mode itself. And something else to consider is a lot of people are, or oh no, sorry, something else to consider is that the, a lot of people who are like worried about the AF system in those cameras, the Mark II cameras are pretty good. Uh, my wife and I go out and sometimes she's shooting an icon, sometimes I am, but honestly, they're doing a pretty good job for like general wildlife photography. It's much better. And one of the things that's really great is the accuracy. It's like it may not focus as fast or uh, as aggressively as a D850 or a D5 or something. But man, when, you, uh, when you're on it and that camera has focus, it's, it, you know you're going to have a sharp photo. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I think they, the, and, I, and, you know, the original cameras kind of made people beat them up a little bit, but they are better. I wouldn't be too afraid of them. It's just that tracking mode itself that really needs some improvement, in my opinion. Uh, Another person asking, uh, any thoughts on the Nikon 800 millimeter? I think about the 800 millimeter about once a week, to be honest with you, but I never pull the trigger. I think my problem is that there's so many times that 600 millimeter seems to be kind of a sweet spot for me. And if I do need more focal length, I can add a teleconverter. And for the most part on the Nikon and Sony lenses, especially Sony, that thing is not really taking up too much sharpness when I put it on there. It's not eating away at it too bad. And I'm real happy with the results I'm getting. So I don't know that I want to spend, I think, what are they, $16,000, $17,000. I don't know if I want to spend that to get just what would amount to a little bit better result. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I am with that. I think the 600 for general wildlife photography is more versatile. But again, really depends on what you're shooting. If everything is at an 800 millimeter focal length away, then it would make a lot more sense to get that than it would a 600 and use a teleconverter and just kind of weld them together. So... Well, let's see here. Haley's asking what my favorite animal is. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, 
I'm going with Lions right now. I really like Lions, but it, it varies. Going with Lions, though. Uh, let's see here. Oh, someone's asking, what computer and software do I use? Uh, I use Macs around. Uh, I have an iMac. There it is over there. And I'm using my MacBook Pro right now. I'm in my makeshift office upstairs. because um, I wasn't able to get downstairs when I first came home. And now I just haven't moved. But uh, yeah, I use an iMac. And for software, I use all Adobe stuff. I'm real happy with that. I do use uh, the Topaz programs too, kind of in conjunction with that. But my primary stuff is Lightroom and Photoshop. Uh, let's see here. 70 to, to oh, sorry, 70 to 200 with a 2X adapter. Any cons? Um, I have seen this tried a lot because it seems like a really good way to get to 400 millimeter. And I can't say, I can't speak to every 200 millimeter uh, or every 70 to 200 at 200 millimeter with that teleconverter. But for the most part, every time I've seen that tried, the results have been disappointing. They have not been up to what people expected or had hoped for. But I, had, I have obviously not tested every 70 to 200 on the market and every teleconverter on the market, so I don't know. I have a strong feeling the S line, the Z stuff for Nikon is probably pretty good. But I, I, I wish I could tell you, but you know, I think it's an iffy proposition. It might be something to think about renting. Whenever I have a question about a lens or uh, you know, even a teleconverter or a camera or something, I always run it first. So uh, it was asking XQD or CF Express. I would say, say uh, CF Express if your camera supports it. It's a little more future proof. Although I think XQD is coming down in price. So you got to kind of balance those. But I want cards that I can use in the future too. So that's the way I would go. That's what I've been doing. I've been buying CF Express. Uh, let's see. Where would I like to travel that I have not been to before? I think uh, the Galapagos Islands are on my hit list. We're supposed to go up into uh, Canada if things work out as far as I go. As I, uh, we're, that's sometime, I think, in June. But we're supposed to go up to Canada, and, uh, like British Columbia. I've never been there, so I'm looking forward to that. But I think Galapagos Islands are pretty high on that list. Uh, we're talking about Antarctica one of these days, too. So those are a couple places I think would be a lot of fun. Uh, let's see here. What update would you like to see to the D6, David's asking? Honestly... As bad as this sounds, and there's nothing wrong with the D6, I love that camera. It's a lot of fun to shoot. It's maybe one of my favorite cameras to shoot, but I'm going to tell you, I'm pretty much transitioning to mirrorless. I was shooting DSLRs. I was shooting them both side by side, but anymore, anytime I go out, I'm grabbing a mirrorless camera. Uh, so yeah, I honestly, I think I, I, I don't have any improvements I'd like to see to the D6 other than to make it mirrorless like a Z9. Let's see here. Oh, man, we were talking about this on the forum. If you guys, By the way, if you guys aren't on the BCG forums, you should go over there. There's uh, We have a great group of people there, just the friendliest group. There's you know Everyone gets along really well. It's unreal for a forum. It's really great. So if you really want a nice forum experience where you can safely ask a question without being berated, give it a try. I think you'd really like it. But uh, we were talking about baiting wildlife. We had actually five pages or so, I think, that went on when no one got in a fight. So there's, you know, kind of shows the quality of people there. But... Uh, my thoughts on baiting wildlife is it depends. And I know that sounds, I know people are gasping right now. Oh, he baits wildlife. Yeah, but, you know, it, what is your definition of baiting wildlife? Are we talking about birds at a feeder? You know, I don't have any problem with that. You know, hummingbird feeder? No, there's no issue there as far as I know. I think it depends on how you're baiting. Um, hold on for a second. I'm getting a little air there. Okay, we're going again. I keep getting a little air message saying the connection is unstable. But, uh, yeah, I think it depends on what you're doing as far as the baiting goes, what kind of animal it is and what it is. For the most part, any kind of baiting that I do is limited to hanging out at a bird feeder. But, uh, you know, other people have different, there's different levels of stuff. I personally am not going to bait animals to get them to come in other than, like I say, songbirds. I don't really have a problem there, but, you know, I'm not going to go out and, uh, you know, bait bears or anything like that. Let's see here. Uh, any issues with the FTZ on the Z6 II? Now, you have to update the firmware, but otherwise they work all right. Uh, the only thing with the FTZ adapters I found is that they do focus a little bit slower from minimum focus distance all the way out to infinity than they do on the you know, F-mount cameras. But uh, usually it's about half speed. But if your focus is closer, it's not as much of a problem. But for the most part, yeah, there's not really any problems there. Let's see. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, form address, someone's asking about the form address. 
It is bcgforums.com, bcgforums.com. And if you go to my main Backcountry Gallery website, there's a little link at the top there that'll uh, you can click to get to the forums there. Um, is it risky to update my Nikon D500 so I can use CF Express? Not at all. Just uh, look up Nikon firmware update plus Steve Perry. I have a whole video that'll tell you how to do that. Not a big problem at all. Uh, let's see here. Do I have any interest in the Sony A1? And how do I like the Sony compared to Nikon? I think a lot of people are wondering about that. I actually do have a Sony A1. I was using it. I've actually been able to get out twice this week to shoot. And in both times was with the A1. And I have to tell you, I am really impressed with that camera so far. It is uh, everything that uh, the marketing said it was. It, uh, I've been using it for flying birds. We were mostly doing seagulls. Nothing very exciting here in Northwest Ohio. But uh, we were out there and just having a blast. And, you know, it does a pretty good job with the bird IAF. You know, it's not perfect. I do have a few, you know, out of focus shots, but you know, it's amazing how well it actually does work. And uh, the camera speed, the, the lack of lag that viewfinder is so fast, the camera is so fast. It is almost like using an optical viewfinder. It is so good. Uh, if you have been hesitant to use mirrorless because of like viewfinder issues and things like that, it's just, this camera would blow you away. It looks really good, but everything about it is really fast. Uh, I have been using it more like at 15 frames a second. I don't use the 30 frames a second. I don't need 30 frames per second of a seagull, but it's nice to have all those options there. And the autofocus is just spectacular. It handles really well. I've, I've been really happy with it so far, but I've shot less than 2000 photos with it. So ask me again in the next live session, and maybe I'll have a few more uh, points to, uh, to make. But overall for Sony versus Nikon, it's, it's really hard to say which one is you know better. I, I can go out and get picture, good pictures with either one. It doesn't really matter that much to me. If, if I'm doing birds in flight and I have my Z, Z7 II, I'm not gonna probably get the same keeper rate as I am with the Sony. The Sony is simply a more capable camera. It does more fr you know, frames per second. It's got better autofocus, all that kind of stuff. But I'm not gonna not get good a few good shots with the Z7 II either. So, um, but as far as just overall, Sony's doing a pretty good job for wildlife right now. The 200 to 600 is a fantastic lens. The 100 to 400 is really good. One of my favorite lenses, the 600 millimeter Sony is definitely the, my favorite 600. I've never used a 600 I like better, and I've used a few of them. Uh, the sharpness, I believe, I'm going to maybe do a test. I'm kind of afraid to put it on YouTube because I'm afraid people, it's going to get turned into a fanboy fury, you know, fight type of thing. But... I'm very curious because I kind of feel like the 600 Sony, the seat of my pants estimate is a little bit sharper than Nikon 600 millimeter. And I'm pretty sure it takes teleconverters better. That teleconverter on that Sony 600 is almost invisible, but it's lighter. It's better balanced. It's just, it's a really great lens. So Sony is doing really good. But again, I wouldn't discount Nikon on this one either because right now Nikon is just behind. They're also talking about releasing a new 600 millimeter for the Z line. And you maybe a couple that with a Z, you know, a Z9 and, all of, suddenly you're, you know, neck and neck again. So, uh, but yeah, overall, I, I'm not afraid to shoot Sony. The nice thing with Sony right now is that we have the lenses, we have the stuff. So, you know, that one of the things that I find with Nikon that's a little frustrating is it's always about either what's coming next or when can I get something that's been released? You know, that's always that, 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 that struggle. People are still looking for 500 PFs for crying out loud. You know, there's always that struggle. And that's one thing that's a little bit frustrating with Nikon. It's like, if you look in the forums, everyone's talking about, you know, I can't wait until I get this with Nikon. With Sony, it's like, oh, yeah, I want this and I have it for the most part. So, you know, you got to kind of consider that, too. Uh, let's see here. Thoughts on a D500 in mirrorless form? Oh, I'd like to see that a lot. I think that would be a super smart move. But I don't know the D500 sales. My understanding is that the D500 sales were not like as spectacular as Nikon thought they were going to be, but I don't know. I don't have any inside information. I'm telling you things I've read on the internet, but you know, I think it would be a good move. I would love, I would love to see something like that. I think that'd be great. Uh, do I think there's going to be a price break on the Nikon like D500, D600 future? Probably. I think as the mirrorless cameras come out, they're going to drop. I, I they like to do that around the holidays. Let's see. Have I stopped buying F mount lenses? Yes, I have stopped buying F-mount lenses. I'm not going to buy another F-mount lens. Uh, I will only buy the Z stuff or the Sony stuff. That's all I'm buying right now. Matter of fact, I've gotten rid of quite a few of my F-mount lenses, my 200 to 500, even my 180 to 400. I just wasn't using it very much. 
uh, the 600 and the 500 PF and the 300 PF. I have all those, but even my 2470, I got rid of because I have an S line 2470, and that thing is spectacular. By the way, if you're if you're a Z shooter and you want just like the best 2470 you've ever seen in your life, get the get the Z one. That's that thing. I was blown away. Love that lens. The 14 to 30 is actually really good too. I think the 28, the 1424 28 is probably better, but I'm using the 14 to 30. It's a little more travel friendly, but man, that thing is great too. Yeah, the lenses with the Z-Line are just outstanding. But uh, anyway, uh, let's see. And someone says they have a DA50, and they were wondering, oops, I, my comments are jumping around. I apologize, guys. Uh, but I'm going to move down here. Someone said they have a DA50, and they were wondering what the, I don't know where the question went. I'm sorry. Uh, they were wondering what the mirrorless equivalent is. Probably closest thing is a Z7 II. It's not really up to the D850 as far as autofocus goes for like action and stuff, but otherwise it's comparable. It's not quite there. I think the Z7 II and the Z6 II are more like a D750, D780 level camera in my opinion. But I mean, as far as as close as you can get, that's that's probably it right now. Uh, maybe if you go to Sony, you you know the A7R4. Uh, let's see here. Uh, someone's asking the Tamron 150 to 600 G2 lens for wildlife, along with the D7200. I have seen that combo in action, and it does work. People are very happy with the results. I've never used those that, that particular lens, so I can't tell you for sure from firsthand experience, but I can tell you on my workshops, people seem pretty happy with it, and the images I've seen, most of them are okay. Uh, I don't know that the 70, that, that 150 to 600 is going to rival like a prime or anything like that, like a 500 PF. Most of the time with Nikon, I do recommend the 200 to 500 though. I think they are a little bit sharper than the uh, 150 to 600s, but of the world, but uh, just some food for thought there. That 200 to 500 is a pretty good lens. Let's see. I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> if I don't know the answer, I have to skip it. Sorry, guys. Uh, someone's asking, how's the bird eye focus on the A1? It's Okay. Um, I'm still kind of evaluating it. It depends on the bird. Seagulls, it seems to pick those up pretty well, but that's basically all I've had. I tried a red winged blackbird, but didn't see the, the eye at all. But it did see it does see it on herons and egrets and even uh, Canada goose. I mean, and, and that's kind of a hard eye to, to crack there, but it does see it. Uh, so yeah, it, it does work. It does work. I am borderline on, what, on how much I'm going to depend on that particular feature. One feature though on the A1 that I really like is the sorry, uh, animal IAF. I was using it with deer and it's just, it's so freeing because you just put it like uh, on wide or zone or whatever you're happen to use, but you put it on wide, it finds the eye and you can make your composition any way you like. And you don't even have to think about moving that AF point around like you normally do it. So it, it's very freeing to have IA, IAF that works. But as far as birds go, especially the flying birds, it's not quite as, um, what do I want to say? It's it's reliable, but it's not super reliable. You know what I mean? It's it'll find it sometimes. It depends on it really depends on the bird. Like for seagulls, I use it. But if I was doing red winged blackbirds in flight, I would not use it. I wouldn't work, I wouldn't rely on it. I would definitely try to rely on, you know, keeping an AF area exactly where I wanted it on the bird. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. That's a, I like that one. So I jumped to the end here. If you, if you had a question I didn't answer, make sure you pop it back in there. That My comments are jumping around. My um, feed, my, my, my internet connection has been a little bit flaky as of late. But this is great. Not a gear question. Uh, how do I personally keep challenging myself in photography as I get more advanced? Um, that is a great question. I'm always looking for a way to get a better shot. Whenever I have a shot of something, no matter what it is, I'm always like, what can I do next? So if I have a great shot of an elephant, I'm asking myself, what would be a way to get an even better shot? What could I do, you know, creatively as far as, you know, should I, you know, get lower? Should I get higher? Should I, you know, use a wider lens? There's so many options out there. And I, I'm always trying to find a way to leverage the technology in my cameras to achieve new and exciting photos that I hadn't been able to do before and try to come up with ideas that I haven't been able to do before. Like, for example, one of the things I've tried and failed so far, so far, is uh, I had an idea to get a shot of a prairie dog with a, like a 14 millimeter lens right outside its burrow. So I had a, like a remote set up and I was trying to do stuff like that. And although it was a failure, it's still, that's, that's the kind of stuff I like to do is come up with ideas 
to kind of push myself. And so I'm not just, you know, taking the same old deer shot or the same old, you know, photograph, you know, you know, and I get on little kicks and little themes like, you know, animals peeking through things. You could, if you look through my galleries on my website, you'll see that's kind of a common theme. So I'm always looking for, you know, those kind of shots. I'm always looking for something unique, something uh, that is not your typical wildlife shot. And it's, it is a challenge. It is a challenge because you're always, you have to always think creatively. Every time you see an opportunity, it's like, what can I do here that's different than what I've done before, what other, everyone else has done before? For that matter, and you know, it, it it is difficult, and you sometimes have to sit back and kind of think it through. And there's a lot of times I will be going to a location, and I'm thinking about what could I do different here? What could I do to get the most dramatic shot of whatever animal that I happen to be after? You know, when we were uh, we were shooting some with the Z cameras, we were up in one of the local metro parks here. It's about an hour away, and one of the things that I've been experimenting with is how to get better shots of some of these little small birds, chickadees and nut hatches and things like that. And, you know, when, you know, and, and so I was like, well, you know, in the place that we go, uh, it's uh, the Metro park we go, they're, they're so tame. You can actually put feet in your hand and you can, and they'll come and they'll land on your hand. Well, unfortunately you can't take pictures while that's happening. So that's, you, you know, it's like, okay, well we have, you know, an audience here that's going to be relatively, you know, relatively easy. If you've ever photographed little birds, you know, they're never easy but they're going to be relatively easy to photograph. So what I've done with those little birds is I created a little feeder system that I can string from a tree and then they can come down to the feeder and I can just position it near perches and stuff. So, you know, you were we were talking about baiting earlier. You know, I say little songbirds, no problem with that, especially the ones that are habituated to it. So, but you know, it's things like that where you're trying to challenge yourself. And as I'm driving up there, I'm like, well, how could I do this? Maybe I, I, I want a nut hatch this time hanging upside down from a branch instead of just sitting on the side of a tree. You know, you want to go beyond those field guide shots. You got to ask yourself, what would that look like? And I think that's, and I think that's kind of the key. Uh, yeah, shooting seagulls is, is good for uh, getting ready to shoot osprey. That's for sure. Uh, what are the drinks? Oh, someone was asking about the drinks. I did not talk about the drink. I have iced tea today. So I have to I have to take it easy today. Let's see here. Thoughts on photography on balancing photography and family life. Uh, unfortunately, my kids are both grown, and one's in college, and my wife and I both shoot. The best way to balance it is to get your spouse to uh, go out with a camera with you. <laughs> get them interested in it. And uh, then all of a sudden, every, you know, they want to go all the time and it, it's a lot of fun. Let's see here. What percentage of the time do you spot metering for birds in flight? That's a good question. Uh, never is probably the answer. I don't really spot meter on them as they're flying. I will use spot metering though, if I want to go to manual mode and maybe I have some birds flying around. And I'm like, okay, I want to, you know, and it's an, a, a tricky thing. You know, the background's dark and the birds are bright. You know, it's just the kind of thing that would throw off auto exposure. If I want to go full manual, I go to spot metering. I find something middle tone that's in the same light as a bird. I meter off of that. And then I, and then I lock that in, take a couple of test shots, and then I'm shooting from there. That's what I, that's how you spot metering. The problem with spot metering actively on a flying bird is that, you can get some discrepancy there with your metering because if that spot meter is slightly off the bird and it sees the background, it's going to underexpose the bird. You know, well, or if it's a dark background, it'll overexpose the bird. It depends what it's looking at. You know, if the if you can keep the spot meter on the bird and the bird's middle tone, you're golden. But otherwise, you know, it's too it's too variable for me. I, you see exposures all over the place. I see people try to do that in our workshops, and they're like, "Why are my exposures all over?" It's like, "Well, were you spot metering?" Oh yeah, I was. Well. There you go. One of the biggest misconceptions with a spot meter is that all you have to do is put the spot meter on your subject. You don't have a perfect exposure. But the truth is what what it's going to do is when you put that spot meter on your subject is you're going to have a middle tone exposure for whatever that's on. So if it's a white bird, it's going to be gray. If it's a black bird, it's going to be gray. So it's going to overexpose black and underexpose white. So you have to be really careful. That's why I use it as an aid to manual exposure. I think it works really great for that. Uh, let's see here. Oh, that's a good question. Melvin's asking, uh, do I like photographing rare species um, or over common species or both? I, I, I like them all. I, I'll shoot everything. Uh, rare species, an okay image of a rare species is okay with me too. Uh, I would rather have a dramatic species, <laughs> shot of a rare species. 
But if it's something really hard, I'll take, you know, your typical field guide shot sometimes. But that's my beginning shot. That's what we were talking about a little bit ago. That's where I start. And then next time I see it, I want to do something better. But if I see, if I'm out there and I see a serval cat or something, I do have a picture of one of those. I have a very generic picture of a serval cat from one of my Africa shots, uh, uh, photograph, photo tours. And I've never posted it. I've never been real super proud of it, but I do have the shot. And now I'm looking for, you know, the next level of shots. But yeah. Um, now, as far as a common animal with a great image, if between those two, uh, I think I kind of I'm, I'm answering that question all uh, by just telling you I didn't ever post the serval shot, but yeah, I think most of the time I would rather have a great shot, like something spectacular of a more common species than just a mediocre shot of a rare species. I will take the rare species, I'll take that shot, but like I say, whether or not I post it or not, because I'm always thinking in my head, I'm going to see that rare species again someday, and I'm going to get a better shot. So that's what's in, that's what's going on up here. So a lot of times I don't want to post something that's I don't feel is as good as it could be. You know what I mean? So hopefully that answers the question. But yeah, I, I think just to expand on that just a little bit. So many times I think people kind of disregard very common species, but you can get really dramatic, very exciting images of just very common species that are, you know, maybe, you know, deer and geese and, you know, stuff like that. Seagulls for that matter. I got some really cool shots of some of those seagulls the other day. And, you know, if you take a normal average shot of a common species, it's not going to go anywhere. But if you take a really dramatic shot of it, you know, people are going to notice it if you post it in that. And, and I think that's worthwhile. And I think, you know, that's a, one of the challenges with photography is going out and being able to get a shot of that caliber of something that's very common. I think if I think it's a mark of a good photographer or somebody who can go out and make any species look good. Uh, let's see here. A couple more here. My voice is starting to crack a little bit. Uh, which, uh, let's see, which body do you recommend for the 600 F4, D850, or D5? It depends what your needs are. Um, I use it on both those cameras. I've used it on both of those cameras. If I need a little more cropping or if I can get a, if it's bright enough, I, I, I prefer the D850, but probably the majority of my stuff was shot on a D5, D6 type of camera. I, I like the speed of those cameras. I'm always looking for action, you know, so it's, it's so that's something to consider too. But uh, the D850, uh, when I was in Africa and I had, uh, last time I was there in 2019, I used my D850 almost exclusively and uh, just because I had the light for it and I wanted the extra resolution. I mean, I'm filling the frame and that, but I, yeah, if I want to make a big, huge poster of this thing, I want to be able to do that. So uh, I definitely, I think the D850, just for the record, I think the D850 is probably the best DSLR ever made. So it's hard to, uh, you know, as far as for general shooting. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. That's a good question. Uh, moving from JPEG to RAW, what to consider? That's a good question. The thing is, there's a lot of steps involved. That's a that, that's a big hurdle and probably more than we can cover here in just a few minutes. But there are things that you are going to have to think about. When you're going from JPEG to RAW, you're going to need something to, the biggest thing is you're going to need something to process those RAW files. So you're going to need something like Lightroom or On One or Capture One or you know, whichever. You're, you know. But it's not really as hard as you might think it is. So many times I hear people like, oh, I don't want to have to process it. But you know, for the most part, we don't need every single shot that we take. If you go out and shoot a thousand images of some you know, flying birds or something one morning, you're not going to use a thousand of them. You're probably going to pick your favorite two or three of them and then you process those. But for the most part, you know, you go into Lightroom and there's, you know, the develop modules, just sliders like, do you want it brighter or darker? Do you want it to shift the color this way or that way? There's a lot of options there. So my record, you know, I, I would definitely give it a try. But that's probably the biggest hurdle when people are going from JPEG to RAW is that whole thing where they have to post-process it. But also keep in mind, most RAW processors have built-in profiles so you can make it look like the camera JPEG would look like anyway. So if you like that, you're done. But you had the option if you wanted to make some of those changes too. So you know, I, I, that, that, that's, the, you know that, that's probably the biggest hurdle. But uh, that in and of itself would probably be a really good video or article. I'll have to think about doing that. I think that's a good question. Let's see here. Oh, someone was asking, this is a good question. I, I can get this one real quick. Uh, when using spot metering in manual mode, would it require auto ISO to be turned on? No, you turn it off. Turn it off if you're using it in manual. <laughs> you 
Yeah, I don't know, Stephen. He's asking if Nikon's ever going to make a macro lens close to the sharpness of the 200 f4D. I hope so. I hope so. That thing, I have that lens too, and I never use it, but I refuse to get rid of it. I, I love it. it. Like you say, the sharpness is just mind blowing. Let's see here. Thank you for the well wishes, everyone, too. Uh, let's see. That's a good question, too. There's so many good questions here, guys. I do apologize. Uh, I'm got about. I'm gonna probably log off in about five minutes or so. My voice is starting to go, but uh, uh, there is one here. Uh, let's see. How can I train myself to be patient with shots and get more selective when shooting rather than just grabbing the shots? That takes some discipline. It really does. You. Th th that is probably the number one problem I see with especially newer wildlife photographers, but just wildlife photographers in general. Every time I'm on my workshop, if there's something cool, the first thing that happens, people walk straight towards whatever it is that is out there that is cool, you know, whatever animal it is, you know, toucan or whatever. And they're like, oh, I'm going to get pictures of that. And they don't look at backgrounds. They don't look at foregrounds. They don't look at the stick that's dividing the bird in half. They just start shooting. And the biggest thing you can learn is to just kind of stay calm when you see an animal, I kind of think of it like a jet fighter pilot. You know, those guys have to be cool under pressure. And if you ever watch any movies, you know, they're all always calm and things are happening all around them. And they're just, you know, level headed the whole time. And you have to kind of bring that to your photography and just kind of think of yourself as a jet fighter pilot, I guess, maybe. And, you know, stay very calm and just go up to that sub, you know, and look at things as you're whenever I'm approaching a subject, I'm watching the background, the foreground, how everything interacts and where if there's any distracting sticks or anything like that. And I'm maneuvering myself so that when I do want to shoot, I'm in the best possible position. I have the best background. I don't have any distractions cutting the bird in half or whatever. So, or the animal in half or whatever. So those are the kind of things, but the biggest thing is just kind of keeping your cool and just, you know, relaxing and accepting the idea that even if you don't get the shot, you know, it's still a good experience. I think that's some of it too. I'm willing to lose a shot. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go crazy. I want to get the shot. So don't get me wrong but I want to get good shots. So to me, getting a grab shot and then ruining the opportunity, because sometimes you do, you run up and you're like, oh, I'm going to grab this really quick. And the bird flies away or the animal runs off. Whereas you could have still gotten the shot if you would have been in a better position. So it's always worth getting in that better position in the long run. So uh, let's see. I think that's going to wrap us up, guys. It has been about 45 minutes. My voice is starting to crack. I'll leave. I'm going to have this in the archives here so uh, you can watch it again if for some reason you want to. I really do appreciate everybody uh, showing up for the live stream today. And again, uh, thank you for everybody. Uh, thank you to everybody who helped kind of support me through this COVID problem. And uh, I hope to uh, continue to improve. And hopefully in a month or two, I will be back to 100%. But at least right now, I'm functional enough to do stuff. So thank you, everybody, once again. And uh, have a great day.